Hi, Robert. Hi. Um, welcome. This is Block Media, the largest crypto and Bitcoin focused media in Korea. Um, have you been to Korea before? I have not. How do you, what's your perception of Korean Bitcoin community? Do you know anything about it? Have you heard about anything? Uh, the, I think the only thing I've ever heard was that some of the highest trading volumes were coming out of Korea. Yeah. That's all I know. It used to be the second largest after mm. US. Yeah. But now it's like third or fourth. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So is it mostly crypto or is it? Bitcoin? It's mostly crypto. Yeah. But the Bitcoin only community is also growing, right? Growing yeah. these days. Great. And there are fans of your, yours as well. Oh, I'm wonderful. one of them. Oh, I thanks. know many of my friends who are following you on YouTube. Well, that's lovely to hear. Yeah. I, I, we, our show does roughly 70% of its downloads are US and 30% are international. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I know there's people out there listening, but I didn't know that about Korea. Yeah, I hope this opportunity um, becomes your chance to grow your international audience uh, group body. Yeah, I hope so as well. Yeah. Uh, could you briefly introduce your personal journey about uh, with Bitcoin? What led you to become such a Bitcoin advocate? Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Uh, I've shared it on other shows, but I would say most of my journey was formed by the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, which I read probably nine years before I discovered Bitcoin in 2000. I read the book in 2000. Five, and I got into Bitcoin initially in like 2014. Mm -hmm. And that book essentially highlights the inception story of the Federal Reserve. It also goes into the nature of money and it talks about the, the specifics of central bank and how central, central banking and how it operates. So that led me to believe that monopolizing money was made one of the main problems in the world. And several years later, I finally found Bitcoin and eventually figured out that it is the solution to central banking. Mm -hmm. So that's been my big impetus, I think, to get into Bitcoin wow. um, to the degree that I have. Before you became a show host, mm -hmm. what was your occupation? What did you do? Yeah, so I have a degree in accounting and finance, mm -hmm. uh, a master's degree in accounting and finance. I was in public accounting for four years and then I was mostly a finance executive in technology firms. Um, and then I ran my own hedge fund for about four years. Oh. And then I started the What Is Money show. So you're a financial expert? Um, well, I, don't, what a, I was a finance guy. I like to say that I'm a recovering finance guy. I'm happy that I don't have to do that work anymore. Yeah. It's, I, I learned shot. a lot. It's very, I learned a lot, but it's very difficult. Um, and I'm much, much happier now that I get to explore ideas space with other people and great authors and things like that. Right. Uh, you've previously talked about Bitcoin uh, being truth in the form of money. Can you elaborate on that philosophy for, uh, for our listeners who might be, you know, not very familiar with the concept? Sure. So there's a number of ways to look at it. Um, Heidegger said that truth is unconcealedness mm -hmm. it means that truth is always when you're trying to get beneath the surface of something the more um, the more layers that that are unconcealed to you the closer you are to truth and Bitcoin is just open source software so quite literally there's nothing that can be concealed within Bitcoin so it's the the greatest human expression of unconcealedness so Heideggerian truth Bitcoin represents it in that way mm -hmm. you could also say truth is a just very simply an accurate portrayal of reality. And I think the reality of money is that it's, it represents time and energy, right? Mm -hmm. It's a medium of exchange for goods and services, but all goods and services have in common is that they require time and energy to produce. So the money, which the, the money supply, which best maps on to the absolute scarcity of time and energy would then be the most truthful money possible. And Bitcoin is the only absolutely scarce money humans have ever invented. Yes. Um, the American pragmatist said that truth is found at the end of inquiry. And the market process is essentially an inquiry machine. We're constantly trying to figure out what is the best, fastest, cheapest way to solve a particular problem. Right. And in that way, I think Bitcoin is, you know, the market is telling us 
through Bitcoin's meteoric price rise that it is the most advanced monetary technology there has ever been. Um, and yeah, that's that's three 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 ways to like. I guess one other way, the Bitcoin time chain, the history of transactions. Yeah, it's essentially an incontrovertible truth. Like you can't you can argue with it, but it's pointless. Like whatever is in the time chain. It's a record of history that can't be changed, altered, misinterpreted. It's it's the most uh, integral or unshakable form of truth in terms of a record keeping system humans have ever had. So there's four ways Bitcoin is truth. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I know you're a big follower of Mises mm-hmm. and Austrian economy, right? Um, how do you believe Bitcoin challenges our traditional understanding of economic principles? Because Keynesian economics is so phenomenal in Korea as well. Uh-huh. I'm sure it's quite similar in the U.S. as well. Yeah, so Keynesian economics is essentially a pseudoscience that exists to justify the monopolization and printing of money. So it's not, it's not science. Um, it's propaganda, frankly. And it's propaganda that exists to convince otherwise smart people that the central bank should exist and they need to control the money supply to maintain a healthy economy. And that false paradigm has engulfed the world um, along with its product, which is fiat currency. So that paradigm of Keynesian economics, it essentially says that when an economy a thing that it says is that when an economy slumps, right, when it's in recession, Mm -hmm. the problem is a lack of consumption. Mm -hmm. So the central bank, what the central bank needs to do is print more money and flood the market with fresh liquidity such that people will once again engage in consumption. Mm -hmm. And when people go to begin consuming, that will induce production. Mm -hmm. This is a classic case of the tail wagging the dog. If you just stop and think about this for two seconds, you'll quickly understand that production must precede consumption. How can you eat an apple that has not yet been produced by a tree? You cannot consume the apple that has not been produced. In reality, production must precede consumption. It's absolutely that way. Of course. So in a Keynesian paradigm, something like Bitcoin, a money that cannot be printed, should not even exist. It should have no success, no demand. Uh, There should be no, no one should want to hold it whatsoever because it should be a useless tool. Yeah. Um, And in fact, that's how they typically label it, right? It's a Ponzi scheme. It's magic internet money. It's going to zero, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, uh, Bitcoin is in alignment with true economics, which is Austrian economics. And we call it Austrian economics, but what it actually represents is the culmination of all economic knowledge across all human history. Keynesian economics is just this 200 year propaganda scheme we've had um, that central planners have put out to justify the scam of stealing from people through inflation. So yeah, Bitcoin is, is kind of, it's converting this classical philosophical debate, right? Are the Keynesians right? or are the Austrians right, which could have gone on forever. And the Austrians were desperately losing because Keynesian, like, the printing of money is such a radically powerful temptation. Yeah. And it's such a successful enterprise, right? People are just duped into this scam. It's, it's the most successful scam in human history in terms of purchasing power stolen. So pre-Bitcoin, Keynesian, Keynesian economics was succeeding wildly relative to Austrian economics. But it converted this, you know, somewhat subjective intellectual debate into a live market test. We can now test directly. Well, does does fiat currency work better or does Bitcoin? Does mm-hmm. Keynesian economic money work better or does Austrian economic money? And as we've seen thus far, Bitcoin is the fastest growing asset in human history. So that classical intellectual debate that's now become a live market test, I think is proving the veracity of Austrian economics. Then there's a follow up question to the last one. Um, There's a, so the kicking the can down the road continues, has been continued for a decade or a few decades. How long do you think it will continue? 
and it'll eventually collapse. You say kicking the can down the road in terms of fiat currency surviving? Yeah, just printing more money and surviving, um, expanding the economy just like that. Yeah, so very difficult to say. Um, and there's a weird sort of double-edged sword here because what you're doing when you're, we always say printing money, by the way, it's not typically printed, right? Most money is electronic. Right. What we're saying is there's a centralized database maintained by the Federal Reserve. They're arbitrarily expanding the money supply by pressing a button, effectively. Right. Now, that what that does is it confiscates purchasing power from savers and reallocates it to those who produce the money or receive the newly printed money first. This is called the Cantillon effect, or it's the redistributive effect of inflation. That process can continue for a really long time, especially when it's done in small amounts, right? Like the, the standard central bank target in the U.S. is 2% inflation. They're basically confiscating economic surplus, right? So the, the productivity gains that would have otherwise been passed into society or passed to market actors in the form of price decreases as we get better, faster, smarter at making things. When the central bank prints money, that, that price decrease is not there, mm-hmm. or in fact, we don't have price increases. And that wealth, that excess wealth is then captured by the money printers, essentially. Now, the question is, how long can it last? How long can this scam last? Well, to the degree that technology increases human productivity, which would again be accreting to savers in the form of price decreases, savers and consumers, it's now being confiscated through the counterfeiting of currency. So if productivity continues to increase at a fast enough rate, Mm -hmm. and the expansion of the money supply is conducted at a slow enough rate, not too fast, not where there's increasing prices at 20% year over year, maybe 2% or 5% or 7%, then the scam can go on for a really long time. So the, the, the rock and a hard place is we want human productivity to expand. We want to increase standards of living, et cetera, et cetera. But that also extends the runway for fiat currency because it gives them more economic surplus to steal and continue the scam. So when you ask me how long can it go on, I really can't tell you. But with the advent of things like artificial intelligence, which we're seeing recently, yeah. could extend the light, the light, the runway, let's say, of fiat currency quite significantly. Now, the good news is that printing of money, which typically was hidden because you had all these fiat currencies being priced in one another, so it was hard to see the debasement because you're pricing one debasing currency and another debasing currency, mm-hmm. and the price of gold is being manipulated over here, so it's not telling the truth, really. Bitcoin is like an irrepressible barometer for that debasement. So the more money printing that occurs, we're going to see that expressed in the Bitcoin price. And um, I think that that's going to be a a strange new psychological phenomenon when people can see that there's a this money is appreciating relative to these other money. So the scam sort of gets its veil ripped off. And um, yeah, I, I hope that because fiat's really bad for the world, right? It's used to fund warfare, yeah. it's systematic, systematic theft. It funds all the bullshit on mainstream media, all yeah. these false narratives. It funds wokeism, like it funds all these psyops and it's, just, it's really bad. So my hope is that Bitcoin by serving as this irrepressible barometer or truth machine of what's actually happening to the fiat currency that people will, will wake up a little more quickly to the scam and hopefully um, opt out. Yeah. I also believe uh, fiat currency is evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are sitting here at Bitcoin Miami 2023. And um, do you, what are you, what are your thoughts on the future trajectory of Bitcoin in terms of the mainstream, mainstream adoption? Is it really happening? Is it getting better when you come here and see? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we had we have U.S. presidential candidates running on a Bitcoin and freedom platform. I mean, when I got into Bitcoin a few years ago, had you said that, people would have thought you were crazy. 
You know, there's yeah. absolutely no way anyone in Washington is going to talk about Bitcoin ever. And here we are six, seven years later. And like, I was on a yacht last night with RFK. Like, it's crazy. It's, it's bananas. Um, so, yeah, Bitcoin is winning for sure. You can see it very clearly in its price history. But I think I see it much more in just the eyes of the people here. You know, mm-hmm. Bitcoiners are very intelligent. They've got very good values, They're very ethical. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you can. And, there, and there's a very tight knit like social cohesion amongst Bitcoiners. I don't know how you defeat a group like that. How can you outcompete the smartest, most aligned, ethical, tight knit group in the world? Um, if you consider the world as a, a mishmash of competing ideological groups, I mean, not only are Bitcoins all the things I just said, but they also have the best tools, right? They have the best money. It's international. You know, there's, there's said to be like a hundred million holders worldwide. Yeah. Um, I feel very bullish on Bitcoin adoption. Me too. I don't know if I fit into that group, but I or, I also flew all the way from Korea, twenty hour flight, and spent my own money to mm. to. I'm, I'm a GA pass, but anyways, <laughs> yeah. There's a strong group, of course. Yeah, all over the world. Friend.